So Genesis chapter 29. And Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. As he looked, he saw a well in the field, and behold, three flocks of sheep lying beside it. For out of that well the flocks were watered. The stone on the well's mouth was large, and when all the flocks were gathered there, the shepherds would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place over the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where do you come from? They said, We are from Haran. He said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? They said, We know him. And he said to them, Is it well with him? They said, It is well. And see, his, see, Rachel, his daughter, is coming with the sheep. He said, Behold, it is still high day. Is it not time for the livestock to be gathered together? Water the sheep and go, pasture them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together and the stone is rolled from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came up with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. Now as soon as Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, Jacob came near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept aloud. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's kinsman, and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. As soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Jacob told Laban all these things. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. Jacob loved Rachel. And he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, It is not done so in our, in our country to give the youngest or the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave, her, gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. 
Laban gave his female servant Bilhah to, to his daughter Rachel to be her servant. So Jacob went in to Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and served Laban for another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am hated, he has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again she conceived and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will be attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again, and bore a son, and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah, and she ceased bearing. And may the Lord bless this reading from his word. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles there, you might like to turn to uh, Genesis chapter 29. And it's still not too late to get a Bible from the front of the church if you would wish to. Genesis chapter 29. And I've entitled the message this morning, The Girl That Nobody Wanted. The girl that nobody wanted. For all of us, there have been times in our lives when we have felt unwanted, overlooked, and disregarded. And that's very painful. It can be quite deliberating. And uh, especially when it's the very ones we look to to love us and care for us and be kind to us who have made us felt unwanted and overlooked or disregarded. And there have also been times, unfortunately, when we have made people that we feel close to feel unwanted and overlooked and disregarded. Perhaps we didn't intend to make them feel that way but our actions and our words have had the result of making them feel unwanted. Now, by God's grace, that's not a permanent experience. It kind of comes and goes, and we find reassurance in human relationships. But there are times when, even in the best of human relationships, they fall far short of what we long for and what we were made for. So this morning we are going to consider the story of Leah, the girl that nobody wanted. Leah, who knew the pain of, uh, of being overlooked and disregarded by those that she earnestly longed to love her and to care for her. Well, the chapter begins with Jacob on the run from his brother Esau. He's on the run all the way to Haran in the north where he was to seek out his relatives. And Jacob didn't know the area very well. He didn't know exactly where his relatives lived. So uh, he found some shepherds and he asked them. And in asking them, he found in asking them that in fact he had already arrived at the very right place and he was already there among the very right people. See that in verse 4? Jacob asked the shepherds, my brothers, where are you from? We are from Haran, they replied. He said to them, do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson? Yes, we know him, they answered. Then Jacob asked them, is he well? Yes, he said. Yes, he is, they said. And here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. The Lord had led him to the very place he needed to go to find his relatives. Now, God had made Jacob a promise back in the previous chapter when they met at Bethel. 
In chapter 28, verse 15, God said to Jacob, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And here in chapter 29, we find God fulfilling his commitment to Jacob, and he did watch over him, and he was with him, and he led him exactly to the right place and to the right people. That wonderful promise comes to us in Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That sounds like Genesis 28, 15, doesn't it? God's loving care oversees and governs us in all our fears and all the tragedy of life in a fallen world. God has promised never to leave us, to always be with us, to never, us, never abandon us to the fickle love of others. And thus Jacob met Rachel, and within a few weeks he fell in love with her and wanted to marry her. Jacob had found his one true love. He was the one who could fill up the empty heart of this runaway boy. But Jacob had no dowry. He had no bride price with which to claim Rachel. So he offered her father Laban seven years of labor in order to marry Rachel. See that in verse 18? Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I'll work for you for seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it's better that I give her to you than some other man. Stay here with me. Now in verse 19, Jacob heard Laban agreeing to his terms. That's what he heard. But that's not what Laban meant. You see, if Laban was, very, was being very truthful and honest, he would have replied in verse 19 what he said down in verse 26. You see, when Jacob said, I want to marry Rachel and I'll work seven years for you, Laban should have said what he said in verse 26, it is not our custom here to give the younger daughter a marriage before the older one. But he kept that little piece of information to one side for seven whole years. Laban, you see, was already hatching a plan to deceive this young man and take advantage of him, neglecting to tell him about their custom in such matters. We are told that Leah, the elder daughter, had weak eyes. No one really seems to know what that means. However, from verse 17... It's quite apparent that it was some form of disfigurement that caused her to be contrasted negatively with the beautiful Rachel. Leah could not compete with her beautiful sister for Jacob's affections. During that whole seven years, he had eyes only for Rachel. After seven years, the wedding day finally came and they celebrated with a wedding feast in verse 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to lie with her. So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. And late at night, when it was very dark, after much feasting and drinking, Jacob takes his bride, heavily veiled, into the tent. And there he consummates the marriage. But when morning came, there was Leah. See that in verse 25? There's an exclamation mark there after the word Leah. Verse 25. When morning came, there was Leah. Exclamation mark. That exclamation mark is there to indicate to us English readers that in the Hebrew, the expression was absolute surprise. He never saw it coming. Surprise and dismay. In the morning, there was Leah. Jacob found himself married to Leah, not to Rachel as he expected. We know it was a genuine marriage on account of verse 24. Verse 24, Laban made his wedding gift to this young couple. A wedding gift of a maidservant who would be with them 
the rest of their married life to serve them. It was customary. So Jacob had no choice. He had to finish out the honeymoon week and then he was able to marry Rachel and work for another seven years without wages. Jacob, the deceiver and schemer, had been outsmarted by another, the crafty Laban. Now Jacob had two wives under the same tent, one loved and one unloved. The ESV, as Andrew read it to us, said hated. In the one tent. Plus, that wasn't bad enough, he also had two servant girls with whom he would be manipulated into sexual relations. For all of them, it was to be a lifelong misery. Jacob's new home was split from the very beginning with favoritism, scheming, manipulation, and deception. Just like the home he had run away from. Just like the home he had run away from. Remember old Isaac, blind and bedridden? Jacob had come to him, pretending to be another. And when Isaac reached out in the darkness and touched Jacob, he thought it was Esau. And when old Isaac spoke out Esau's name, Jacob answered, and so the deception was complete. And now when Jacob reached out for Rachel in the darkness of the marriage tent, another answered. And so the deception was complete and the consequences locked in. Oh, what a wicked web we weave when first we try to deceive. Shall I say that again? Oh, what a wicked web we weave for those taking notes. When first we try to deceive. My mother drilled that into me when I was about six years old. A wise woman. Well, from this point on, chapter 29 is taken up with Leah. Jacob consents to fulfilling his marital duty to Leah, but she remained the unloved wife. You see that in verse 30? Jacob lay with Rachel, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. And beginning of verse 31, when the Lord saw that Leah was not loved, or when the Lord saw that Leah was hated. All her life, Leah had been in Rachel's shadow, humiliated and often disregarded and overlooked. The young men had always had eyes only for Rachel. So Laban had to figure out a way to get Leah married off. When the unsuspecting Jacob came along, Laban saw his chance. So the girl her father does not want is given to a husband who does not want her either. She is the girl that nobody wants. What must it have been like for Leah to pretend to be Rachel that night, knowing the response she would get from Jacob in the morning? She was trapped, you see. She was helpless within this dysfunctional family. All Leah wanted was to be loved. Loved by her father, loved by her sister, loved by her husband. But it was not to be. However, we see from the beginning of verse 31 that the Lord loved Leah. The Lord had not forgotten Leah. And the Lord had something better in mind for Leah. Better than what her father Laban had planned for her. Better than what her husband Jacob was prepared to give her. Better than her sister's ongoing hostility toward her. All that was left to Leah in this dreadful situation in which she was imprisoned for the rest of her life all that was left to Leah was the naming of her children. And it's in the naming of her children 
that we gain an insight into Leah's heart of grief and sorrow. In the naming of her children, we gain an insight into the personal relationship she cultivated with the Lord in the midst of her sorrow. In the naming of her children, we gain an insight into the wonderful blessing God had in mind for her as a mother to the nation. Verse 32. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Reuben, for she said, It is because the Lord has seen my misery. Surely my husband will love me now. Reuben means to see. Now perhaps my husband will see me and love me. Leah, you see, longs to be seen and she longs to be loved by her husband. She too longs for one true love. Leah has been invisible all her life to those who should have seen her and loved her. Yes, Leah is beginning to believe that the Lord sees her, but her longing is for her husband to see her. He who has eyes only for another. Verse 33. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Simeon means one who hears. Leah understands that the Lord hears the silent cry of her unloved heart, as we saw in our call to worship this morning in Psalm 5. God hears the silent cry of the burdened heart. Yes, God sees Leah, and God hears Leah, Reuben, Simeon. God sees Leah, and he hears Leah, and he loves Leah, but Leah's longing and focus is to gain her husband's love, to gain his seeing and his hearing. Verse 34. Again she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, Now at last my husband <coughs> will become attached to me, because I have borne him three sons. So he was named Levi. Levi means attached. So Leah longs for her husband to see her, to hear her, and to be attached to her. Emotionally attached. Of a heart that's attached to her, connected to her. But Jacob's heart, you see, is attached to another. Leah was the unloved one, and she knew it with a constant and painful awareness. Every single day, she was condemned to see the man she longed for in the arms of Rachel, the one in whose shadow she had lived all her life. From her baby Levi came the priesthood of Moses and Aaron. But the Lord had an even greater blessing in store for Leah, the girl that nobody wanted. But before we get there, we should remind ourselves of the futility of setting our hopes and dreams on the love of another person. We have all made that mistake. And we will continue to make that mistake of setting all our hopes and dreams on the love of another person. And the disappointments that we receive are God's way of turning our hearts to him. Because only he can be our true spouse. Here is a powerful reminder that physical attractiveness is not the way of love and joy. If that's all there is, then the marriage will be a daily grief of unmet expectations. Now the Bible does not shy away from the hardship of being married nor the hardship of being single. As single people struggle with the idea of marriage, married people struggle with the reality of marriage. Love is blind, but marriage is an eye-opener. 
And each state, whether married or single, requires the participants to regard the Lord as their true spouse and to cultivate a personal love relationship with Him, first and foremost, as the only one who can fulfill our hopes and dreams. <clears throat> you see, this compelling and tragic story of Leah reminds us, as indeed the whole Bible reminds us, that even the best of human relationships fall far short of what we long for and of what we were made for. Our world, in its myriad of voices about love and sex and living together, promises so much and delivers so little, in the morning, it's always Leah. Exclamation mark. And the reason these things do not satisfy is because they were never meant to. No human relationship can bear the burden of what only God can provide. No human relationship can bear the burden of what God only can provide for the deepest longings of our heart. We must look deeper and further to a hope that lies beyond our human relationships. And that's what Leah must do. Rather than seeing the Lord's provision of babies as the way to gain her husband's heart, she must look elsewhere. She must look to the Lord himself as her source of joy and thankfulness. And that brings us to son number four, verse 35. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, This time I will praise the Lord. So she named him Judah. This time I will praise the Lord. What's happened in Leah's heart? That this time she's going to praise the Lord. Not like the last times. Not like the last times when she was taken up with her husband, seeing her and hearing her and being attached to her. Now Leah is beginning to focus on God alone as her one true love. And in this, Leah reminds all of us, married or unmarried, as to where our true spouse is to be found. And the blessings that God will give will far surpass the blessing to be found in any human relationship. Of all the baby boys born to Jacob, <clears throat> and there were 12 of them, of all the baby boys born to Jacob through his two wives and his two concubines, only Leah's baby, Judah, was of the Messianic line. For from the tribe of Judah would come King David, and eventually King David's greatest son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. <clears throat> In the midst of all this tragedy and, and heartache, <clears throat> God raised up a Messiah. Who would have thought, from all the angst of Jacob's tent, all the grief, all the personal animosity, all the relation, relational sin inside Jacob's tent, that out of that, out of that wickedness and chaos and horribleness, God would raise up a Messiah. You see, God in his providence continues to overlook and govern the affairs of us all, sinful or otherwise. And in the midst of the worst of human tragedy and sinfulness, God is there to raise up a banner, a hope, that in Jesus Christ there is something better for those who are groaning under the weight of life in a fallen world. His plans and purposes always overrule. What did God do for Leah? He made her the mother of Jesus. The girl that nobody wanted became the mother of the man that nobody wanted. The girl that nobody wanted became the mother of the man that nobody wanted. Remember what they said of the Lord Jesus? He came to his own, and his own received him not. 
He was the man that nobody wanted. He came to his own and his own received him not, so they put him to death. But he was none other than God's only son, sent from heaven to die the death that we deserved. God raised him up to be the saviour of all who placed their trust in him for the forgiveness of their sins. God's providential care in Jesus Christ will never leave us. It was God who gave Leah a heart that praised him in the midst of a tragic marriage. The Lord was her true bridegroom. And the Lord is the bridegroom of us all, married or unmarried, for all those who have been rejected and betrayed by those who should have loved them. So take your relational disappointments to Jesus Christ and see his glory and his grace come through for you as you pray and as you reflect and as you read the scriptures and as you open your heart to his love sacrifice for you and as you share your story with others and as you rejoice together that in the midst of tragedy and heartache and disappointment and regret and in heaviness of heart, there is something, there is something from heaven above that fills our heart with a peace and a joy and a rejoicing that cannot be explained by the situation and circumstance in which we find ourselves. And if you feel unwanted, overlooked or disregarded, remember the Lord sees and hears and knows your situation in your heart. Call out to him in prayer for his comfort, grace, mercy and forgiveness. Talk to the ones in your life who have caused you to feel this way and seek their awareness and consolation. And if you are one of those who has made another feel unwanted, overlooked or disregarded, listen carefully with compassion to what they have to say to you. Admit your relational failings. And with a repentant heart, confess and ask for their forgiveness. And the mercy and forgiveness of Leah's greatest descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ, will be your comfort and joy. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, our hearts go out to Leah and the situation that she was placed in by others who should have cared for her. We thank you, Father, that by the time the fourth baby came along, she was able to praise you for her situation. And Father God, as we consider Leah, we consider our own hearts and our own situations. And Lord, we want you to teach us how to praise you in the midst of life's disappointments. We want you to teach us about the peace that Jesus gives that's not available in this world. We want you to teach us what it means to be married to Jesus Christ in union with him. We want you to give us a fresh experience, a fullness of our hearts, of what it means to have Jesus Christ make that promise to us that he is with us in every situation. So Father, we thank you that in Jesus Christ we have that assured promise and and we pray, Father, that if, if there's anybody that we need to talk to or if there's anybody who needs to talk to us, that you would give us the courage and the faith to turn those relationships around that we might have much reason to praise you for your grace and for your mercy. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.